Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. We we are waiting for uh, Eric, who's gonna be here in the next uh, uh, few minutes. But um, I'm very happy to have you, everyone here today, to attend our episode of uh, Frontiers. Frontiers, our webinar in which we touch on the latest uh, research and breakthrough in asset management, and we like to talk with leading academics and industry and industry experts. And today we're gonna talk about a very interesting topic, which is AI-powered R&D, which is accelerating innovation. Basically how expertise, technology, and best practice put innovation on, uh, on repeat. So leveraging technology, not just uh, as a result, but also as a part of the uh, innovation process. To me, uh, with me tonight, we have uh, um, Nelly Bonfiglio, which is the Chief Commercial Officer at Codemotion, with more than 10 years of experience in tech and digital service in uh, very important scale-ups, which I'd like to introduce. Then we have um, Eric Michels, with, uh, who's gonna join us in, uh, in a few minutes. He's an exec executive architect at IBM. He has background in business analytics and, uh, and AI practitioner. He's guiding clients nowadays with the first steps in quantum computing. Then we have uh, Tiziana Russo, which is an associate professor of management and a European Research Network member with whom she collaborates in several research projects. And then finally, Emil Avirashid, who is a friend and a journalist and an entrepreneur himself, who is a founder of a Startup Business, a top magazine about startup and, and uh, scale-up. Um, I kindly ask them to, uh, to uh, turn on the camera. Um, who uh, am I? I am moderating. I am the CEO and co-founder of uh, M.M. We are the leading player in applying artificial intelligence to, to the world of investing. Uh, we believe that AI is the future of asset management and our mission is uh, to bring understandable AI in, in every portfolio. But without further ado, uh, I will just jump into the uh, agenda for, for this evening. So the, the webinar is going to be about Roughly 30 minutes plus, uh, plus 10 minutes of Q&A. I strongly suggest that you can participate with the Q&A both on Zoom, for who's following us on Zoom, or on uh, LinkedIn, because uh, we're streaming live uh, there as well. Um, the topic of tonight will be rethinking culture, organization, and processes in the age of AI, why AI can improve R&D success, and then the benefit and best practice, practice, uh, practice of open innovation. And then finally, uh, a Q&A. So my first question goes to uh, Nelly. You are the chief commercial officer of one of the largest European tech communities. Yet while AI is driving innovation, at the same time, tech talent is in high demand. What is your pulse on that? How is important is the human factor in software and AI development? Okay, so first of all, thanks Tommaso for this invitation and good afternoon to all the panelists and all the people that are attending this webinar. And thanks for the opportunity to share what happened in our market because of course, uh, you asked me a super interesting questions regarding the high demand of tech talent that there is right now uh, in the world. And uh, Codemotion is the biggest tech community of developers with more than 200k of developers on our digital platform and across Europe. Uh, yes, you say a super interesting thing because uh, from our privilege observatory, what we see is that uh, uh, there's a super high demand of tech talent in the world and uh, probably the pandemic has accelerated this process. Uh, in fact, uh, ad in addition with the digital transformation process, of course, not only the tech companies right now are looking for tech talent, but also the traditional companies that right now work in a traditional market that needs to innovate their business model. But uh, the problem is that uh, in Europe, from our observatory, what we see is that we have uh, uh, almost 6 million of developers, but only 13% of them are actively looking for a job. So we are talking about more, more or less more than 600k of developers. 
But on the other end, the tech vacancies in Europe is of uh, more than 1 million of tech vacancies. So uh, we can see immediately that there is an important gap between the demand and the supply. So uh, the demand of high, high talent is, uh, is really important. And uh, for us, uh, the human factor in software development and especially in AI, it's so important. And because uh, we are a community of developer, of course, uh, software is written and is made from human to human so it's important to have the right people engaged uh, to help this uh, this continuous innovation um, our purpose in Codemotion is to innovate the future and to change the future through innovation line of code by line of code. Uh, so for us, it's important to put developers in the right organization to help this continuous improvement of innovation. Uh, but that's not so easy because uh, not only the, not, not all the companies right now uh, has the, the good tech reputation. So uh, all the tech talent right now prefer to go for, to work, uh, of course, in well-known companies or companies that has an important tech reputation and for this reason what we are doing uh, is to uh, create uh, as a community an important bridge between the tech talent on one end and the companies on the other hand because on one end, we would like to help developers in their professional growth through um, participating to events, having opportunity of networking and so on. But on the other end, the purpose of our company is to, um, uh, to, to, to make became the companies the best place where right developers and right tech talent would like to work and stay. Uh, of course, uh, it's an important challenge, but uh, uh, as I said, uh, as I said before, uh, of course, uh, innovation is impossible without humans. So our purpose is to put developers and companies in, in touch to fill this important gap. That's it. These are my two cents, uh, Tommaso. I guess that, yeah, the human factor is always, is always a uh, Crucial. Uh, no, no, the code, the code doesn't doesn't code itself. Let's put it this way. Exactly. Emil, just on that, you've seen innovation ecosystem explode over the last decade. In your opinion, which are the factor behind the rise uh, of innovation? And Tiziana, what do you see as the biggest opportunity and trade off of open innovation? Uh, who goes first? I go first. Emil, go first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well. That's true. The uh, innovation ecosystem is flourishing, and uh, uh, this year, 2021, was a uh, key year because we saw the growing, exponential growing of the investments uh, in startups and scale ups, and uh, in general, in companies that are developing innovations, not just in Italy, but uh, in all the world. And, uh, and this is a very good sign. Um, it's also true that. Uh, Innovation comes uh, and the innovation that becomes uh, uh, that create uh, creates value uh, via the creation of companies and startups. Uh, it's uh, more uh, a matter of mindset. I mean, it's of course it's very important to have uh, bright ideas. It's important to have. Uh, uh, investors and it's important to know how to create and develop a company but what uh, is the real change compared to the previous generation of entrepreneurs is the fact now we have a, new, a completely new mindset so uh, I always say is that innovative companies uh, they are innovative not uh, just because they do new things but because they do uh, uh, the entrepreneurship in a new way. And this is a key aspect in terms of uh, understanding uh, uh, the phenomenon. And I'm sure uh, Tiziana uh, will tell us more about this because uh, when there is open innovation and you have uh, new generation entrepreneurs and old style companies that needs to, to, to talk to each other, uh, they they don't speak the same language at least at the beginning so that it's the proof of the fact that we have a new mindset and this is uh 
something uh, uh, in my opinion very interesting to know and to learn in order to better understand the ecosystem. Okay. Thank you, Emil. Uh, and thank you also, Tommaso, and also all the panelists the, for the opportunity to share some preliminary insight of an NOE project at the Department of Economics and Management Organization, where I work, I am still carrying out with my research group. My reflection is also um, on what is the change in innovation practice. We can see that uh, since the first publication of uh, Chesbrough's ideas of open innovation, something is changing in the same definition of open innovation. For example, in 2014, the chess group proposed an updated definition of open innovation. He defined open innovation as a distributed innovation process based on purposely managed knowledge flows across organizational boundaries using the pecuniary and non pecuniary mechanisms in line with the organizational business model. So the focus moves from the, the interest of open innovation as the acquisition of new ideas, of new research, to the ideas that the open innovation is mainly concerns, concerns of new business model. And also the attention to non-pecuniary mechanisms that are seen as additional drivers of open innovation. So the recent open innovation debate has been devoted to the reflecting on new technological and organizational changes and discuss how they can alter our thinking about open innovation. Several technological and organizational trends have raised many questions. For example, the massive advances in key technologies such as artificial intelligence and machine learning have deeply changing when and how organizations can rely on open innovation. These technologies are inventory dynamics and enable the use of data in novel ways to produce new products and services, supporting firms to implement new open innovation models. Such models often rest on the firm ability to generate and bundle massive amounts of data. So an emerging team in the innovation literature is how openness can build bridges across organizations to use of data. For example, consider solution as uh, Amazon Web Services. We can see as many companies have adapted it widely to support the internal innovation processes. And Amazon profit directly through increased sales enabled by such open services innovation. At the same time, platforms are one of the key organizational developments that is transforming how market actors create a capture value from innovation. At the same time, as many companies are transforming their business, moving from selling products to selling services, the data-driven business models will be even more central to realizing the Chesbrook idea of open services innovation. In this sense, open innovation needs to incorporate very fist of data generation and data management with other key resources. It is needed to properly understand the scale of data generated and how data could become integral to a new firm open innovation model. If you think also to recent launch of new Amazon SageMaker, a machine learning service that empower developers to use machine learning without prior experience, it is a clear example of how open innovation is transforming itself to idea of innovation as a service. Thus, open innovation is associated with many data management challenges, such as creating, capturing, and sharing data within and across firms. We also need to consider that the success of this new open innovation model may lead to new externalities due, for example, to data breaches, abuse of privacy, or anti-competitive behaviors enabled by the proprietary access to data. For open innovation, such business practices need to consider more the ethical and the legal dilemmas grounded in data ownership. So further, open innovation debate, for example, ask what is the tension are between revealed data and capturing more value from data. Thank you. Great. Um, we have Eric, which is now uh, connected. If it's, uh, I don't know if you can hear us now. Eric, can you hear us? Not yet. So we'll jump back to Nelly. Nelly, speaking of partnership, uh, so the concept of, of open innovation or, or, or open collaboration, we recently held a coding uh, challenge uh, ourselves as M.M. with you guys to connect uh, with uh, top software engineers across Europe, uh, thanks to your support. How did it go? Are companies 
changing the way they attract talents. Yes, absolutely, Tommaso. Uh, I'm happy to share uh, one of the main best practices that we had in Codemotion, partnering together. Uh, in fact, uh, going back to what I, what I have already told you before, uh, because it's important on one end to attract developers, but on the other end to have products that help companies to be attractive and find the right people. Uh, what, we what we decided to do together is to launch a coding challenge inside of our platform. Uh, because uh, your, your main goal was to hire a FinTech software engineer. So it was important to find the right products all together that will match the developer's needs on one end and your needs on the other hand. Um, let me explain what a coding challenge is uh, just in a nutshell. A coding challenge is a, uh, is a true challenge that we launch on our platform of developers uh, and where developers has been asked to solve a real challenge using some kinds of programming language, okay? Uh, and uh, they receive a score when they complete the challenge and they are ranked uh, of course in terms of the time they spend to solve the challenge and in terms of the quality uh, that they, uh, they solve the problem. Um, the important results that we gain together is that uh, the challenge has a, dura had a duration of uh, one month and a half and we collected more than 100 people registered to this challenge and of these 100 people the 80 percent of them decided to share their data with the company, so with M.M. Um, and 47 of these people started a selection process, so an hiring process with M.M. Um, um, this data for itself uh, means nothing probably, but uh, I would like to put all the people uh, in this panel to the fact that uh, thanks to the high brand and te brand tech reputation of M.M. Um, we gain these important results. Uh, because what we discovered is that uh, inside of our community, M.M has a super good and super strong tech reputation because compared to the normal number of people that take part on our coding challenges, the number that we gain uh, uh, together with M.M were pretty higher compared to the normal one. Uh, so again, uh, of course, uh, to, uh, to improve the open innovation processes, artificial intelligence processes. Uh, from my side, the human factor is important and we are strongly committed in our companies like M.M, of course, to hire the right people. Uh, so uh, that's it from my side, Tommaso. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I guess it was uh, it was indeed a, a rush. I, I was one of the one uh, then looking at the, the CV coming through uh, after the challenge. Uh, so we now have Michael uh, Eric Michels uh, connected. Uh, Eric, uh, just to remind you, is a chief executive architect at uh, IBM. Has a background as a business analytics, and uh, uh, he's now guiding clients in the first step in, in quantum computing. So Eric, you work in the tech industry for the last twenty years. Uh, you saw a lot of technology, especially uh, artificial intelligence, uh, and you saw how much that contributed to science across many industries. Could you help us connecting the dots? What has been a game changer technology and where? Ooh, uh, a game changing technology. Um, that's, um, yeah. Um, I would say that certainly what will be a game-changing technology, in my opinion, is quantum computing. Huh? So one, one of the most recent technologies huh? that is certainly um, has the promise to be a game-changer. Um, because, yeah, I can go a little bit more into detail here, because with quantum computing, we think to be able to solve problems that are not uh, solvable today by classical computers, uh, so, um, of course, quantum computing will not replace classical computing, but rather uh, extend it. Uh, uh, there will be a kind of coexistence uh, between classical computing on one hand and um, quantum computing on the other hand. Uh, and if you take a look to the application areas of quantum computing, we could say that quantum machine learning is certainly very promising. And why is it very promising? Because um, 
first of all, we see when we compare it with classical machine learning already some advantages, but also it is a discipline that does not require ultimate uh, perfect quantum computers. As you know, eh, the quantum computing systems are not yet completely noise free. Eh? And the quantum machine learning algorithms, they allow us to work with um, what we call intermediate, uh, uh, noisy intermediate scale computing. Eh? So we can already, uh, that is very promising. So that is certainly one of the latest game changers I have seen. Eh? Before we have seen other game changers. Um, for instance, we have seen blockchain. We thought it was really a game changer, but yeah, I don't see so much projects at this moment in time anymore with blockchain. Uh, so people had expected much more uh, of it, I think. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, of course- let me, let, 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 let me follow up on that. I think it's interesting. Why do you think it's not that? Uh uh that a game changer what do you think there are not that many uh projects going on with uh, with blockchain yeah. at this stage yeah. how i see of course i am not to be a very transparent a deep expert in blockchain but how i see it is that uh when you want to start a blockchain pro yeah, the technology okay that's nice but one when, when you want to change a project in blockchain what i see often is that you need quite some um organizational effort po even political uh, influence to uh, to find an agreement uh, between the different uh, participants to the network and to the business network and that is not always that requires quite some time so from the technology point of view, it's very good, it's nice. But before you get to, um, let's say, a, a blockchain application of which it is the objective to have multiple parties, huh? uh, it takes quite some negotiation time and um, quite some, let's say, uh, discussion and meetings before you get to an agreement to, to how to use it. That's, that's how I feel it, how I see it. Uh, um, <laughs> I agree. It, it is indeed uh, it is indeed quite complicated to have <laughs> to put together a, a lot of a lot of interest uh, um, for a technology for a new a new solution, and I guess that's why also open innovation plays such a major role. You know? the, the idea of combining uh, industry expert with uh, with innovative scale up or, or, or startup. Tiziana, uh, a recent study from the Polytechnic found that the more than half of open innovation done between large company and, and small uh, startup um, uh, happened exact, exactly like that. How do you see that uh, uh, this model will become or is becoming the new normality? Um, again, when uh, we look at innovation, it is interesting to look at also at the history of uh, open innovation. And we know that expanding the search horizon to identify external knowledge is a cornerstone of uh, open innovation. However, in the last uh, decade, big organizations have widely used crowds and consumers to gain insight into their needs of new ideas. Several search expanding technologies such as uh, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing platform have greatly grown in popularity. However, while this technological development do not alter the original conceptualization of openness, they underscore that the access to distant and distributed knowledge is expanding at an expensive rate, potentially changing who can play the open innovation game and from where. However, it is surprising as in many cases, the rich one company can get with both crowdsourcing or crowdfunding caps at cost of selecting between many different alternatives. And now it may be difficult to identify real novel back to ideas. So to overcome these challenges, open innovation strategy of a large firm is transforming as a reactor enter the market. Again, this transformation, for example, is boosted by new technologies. Consider the role of artificial intelligence in supporting company to better analyze what is held in the open digital world. Many AI programs support firms first to assess all their internal data to understand where the problem lies. Then they support the firms to scan for innovation on the web, look at the startups, inventors, all the actors which have an extensive digital footprint. As a result, large incumbents seek new ideas directly from outside entrepreneurs. 
from crowd suggestions to crowd scanning, companies are still picking up the knowledge of how to side the world, but they are doing so in a more informed and effective way. However, while companies connect to the increasing ecosystem of new startups, scale ups, they also realize that open innovation through collaboration with these different actors would be also complicated and challenging. While there are many accelerators, for example, many have a lot of integration issues with the large organization. Hence, the emergence of corporate accelerators that are programs launched or founded by large companies to attract talent, develop ideas, and support the build and the growth of new companies. Any digital giants such as Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and so on, have created their corporate accelerators to connect their technological platform and market skills with the creativity, the disruptive creativity of startups and scale ups. However, considering this new form of collaboration, we also can see as the blending of large and small firms' relative advantages and disadvantages, different perspectives and goals, remain a long-standing issue in the open innovation debate. For example, an issue is the opportunity cost faced by incubated firms when they tie the knot with the large incumbents, as well as the challenge of high-tech small firms with their outbound open innovation. A complementary issue by the perspective of large R&D intensive firms is the question of whether external sources are substitute or complementary to their internal R&D research department. All these aspects remain open to debate, and they likely become more important to untangle as open innovation becomes increasingly ubiquitous. Um, Emil, uh, is this something happening just uh, in Europe, in the US? Do you see any difference? Is it, uh, is it a global trend, the open, open innovation, or do you see uh, any differences uh, around the world from your vantage point? No, no, I think open innovation is something that is going to happen everywhere as long as uh, uh, the need to innovate uh, it's present for any kind of an organization and some organizations are understanding that a good way to accelerate the innovation process is to uh, work uh, uh, with the startups because the startups, they have, you know, the innovation, the DNA, they are faster and quicker to implement a new technology. So it's going to happen everywhere. And uh, it's also very important in order to um, support the evolution of the startup ecosystems, because uh, if we have uh, large companies that at the end of the day, we're going to buy the startups, so the startup can do the so-called exits. Uh, is uh, uh, also an important sign uh, because uh, it brings uh, even more value to the uh, startups and gives to investors uh, more uh, trust in terms of investing in new companies, in emerging companies. And uh, so it's, uh, it's both way, both, uh, uh, let's say, industrial advantage and also uh, an advantage for the entire ecosystem. And um, of course, uh, uh, not all large companies are so smart. Uh, there are companies that are still uh, not so good to understand how to work with their startups. And uh, of course, it's a pity, but it's their problem. And uh, at the same time, we, are all, we have also startups that are not looking for the exit, but they are trying to become global company and they are uh, some of them are quite successful in that so we are seeing we are uh, witnessing entire uh, business and industrial sectors that are um, under a disruption wave uh, thinking for example on finance sector with a fintech with the new banks emerging and all the services of fintechs emerging and uh, but you you can name any 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 sector and um, also there are uh, new opportunities that are emerging for example i expect the next year would be very interesting for the so-called space tech or new space or new space economy uh, because also <clears throat> 
In this case, we are uh, witnessing a change of paradigm where the space that uh, till a few years ago was uh, 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 an area where just uh, governments uh, or public organizations can have a role. Now it became a, a new uh, economy uh, ground of conquer. And uh, this is changing also how the things uh, are happening and is pushing a lot in terms of the development of new technologies. So uh, it's uh, very important that the new generation of companies and the old generation of companies uh, work uh, together. And uh, I hope that even the so-called small and medium uh, enterprises we're gonna to understand more and more the importance to intercept to talk to to talk to and to work with uh, uh, innovative startups and scale-ups uh, following up on this uh, and to conclude our, our open uh, question and, and open up for for q a we already have quite a few uh, questions coming up so try to be quickly so we can uh, answer as many as possible Eric, uh, uh, we touch on different factors that will drive uh, uh, innovation and opportunity. We we'll see how much the role of human, whether it's the coder behind the code or, um, or just thinking how to uh, uh, and where to adapt to, to apply technology to, to solve a, a real life problem is, is a factor. We've seen how much the contribution of a focused company or startup that just do one thing with big players is uh, uh, important. And we all know that IBM has been uh, leading the innovation on, on different fields over the last uh, uh, decades. Um, from a, an R&D standpoint, and where actually artificial intelligence is helping to uh, have a more autonomous almost R&D process, where do you think is the future of these scientists or tech people in, in these sectors? And where do you think that uh, and how uh, will be applied in different fields over the next, the next uh, decade? You're on mute, I think, yeah. Yeah, as a general answer, uh, yeah. Um, my first reaction to the question would be that um, how I see it and how, uh, what, what I feel uh, in this era is that um, the difference between, and I don't know if it is a correct, an a complete answer on your question, uh, Tomaso, but I see that the difference business and IT is disappearing. I see really a fusion uh, between uh, business and IT. IT is business and vice versa uh, with the new uh, business, with the new digital transformation, as we call it. So I think that um, people who are bringing innovation with, their, with technology are really wanted everywhere and are really needed in any business. That's how I, I feel and see it. Um, and uh, of course, there you also see that there is also the reason why I see that IBM will always play that important role because on the technology level, we continuously try to bring that innovation. Huh? Uh, perhaps at our marketing efforts are not always the best success ever, but our technology innovation is certainly still leading with quite some patents, with quite some new uh, innovation. Huh? Um, yeah, but, uh, and I think that, uh, yeah, this innovation is becoming more and more important because, yeah, as I said, fusion IT and business is there. So, yeah, I don't know if it is an answer on your question, Tommaso. Uh, if it is not complete, so please ask an additional I, question. I, 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 I think it does, and I would open up for Q&A because I have quite a few that uh, uh, I'm getting passed on. So the first one is uh, uh, Fornelli, and it's uh, uh, it's it's from Poland. It says, "How are companies try to be uh, trying to be more attractive towards a community of developers on one side, and then what is the key element that you think is uh, crucial for to attract them, basically?" Okay, I was on mute. Okay. 
Uh, yes, it's a super interesting question because uh, right now there's the war of the talent and all the companies do the mistake to see only the hiring process. So all the companies right now would like to hire right talent. But uh, the, the main issue is that they see the issue, the problem from a strict point of view because they don't see the rest of the funnel. And uh, in Codemotion, but in general, I suggest that all the companies need to be engaged to cover all the employee life cycle funnel. This starts from being attractive, being engaging, and after that, uh, you can think to the hiring process and after the hiring process to the retention process. Uh, looking at uh, what do I have to do to be attractive uh, to, uh, for, uh, for developers, um, I always say that uh, there are four main ingredients that are so important. Uh, the first thing is the way uh, or the way um, the job position is written, and that's important for uh, tech talent and developers that uh, the salary package is transparent for the people. Uh, the second thing is the transparency, because uh, tech talent and developers mostly would like to work for companies that, are, that have a super transparent way of working in terms of the methodology that they use and the technological stack that they use. Uh, another thing, the third, is the coherence, the coherence with the values and the culture of the company. Uh, lots of the mistakes that the companies does is that uh, they don't share we in the in the right channel what are the main culture and the main values that they have and that's really really important for developers and another thing is the velocity the velocity of the hiring process because uh, Tommaso probably you know the situation because most of the people uh, in M.M are engineers uh, software developers etc cetera, etc cetera. but the average time a developer stay in a company is uh, almost one year and a half so if the selection process the hiring process that is so long. The problem is that uh, all the people stay in a company more or less one year and a half, and the hiring managers need to restart uh, the process. Uh, and because, uh, as we already told before, uh, there's an important mismatch between the supply and the demand. If we invest so many times, uh, so much time to hire the right people, uh, you lose the possibility to hire them because they have lots of opportunities uh, outside. So it's important to be really focused and to be really uh, fast uh, in the hiring process. So these are the four main ingredients uh, to be attractive and to be sure uh, to attract uh, the right tech talent. Uh, couldn't agree more. I mean, <laughs> you need to be fast. Let's put it this way. We, we, we experience Absolutely. that. Uh, that a lot. I have a couple of questions that I'll try to, to, to sum it up. And I think, Emil, you're the, 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 the right uh, person to, to, to answer this. Basically, it's a, where do you see the expansion growing in the uh, fintech, in particular, ecosystem uh, over the next years? Um, there's, there's a bunch of them. Uh, some of them are asking uh, what are the new trends in terms of technology and what are the new geographic areas? Let's 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 punch it up in let's uh, you know group it in, in two questions. So the new tech in the opportunities that you see and the new geographic areas in, in Europe that you see more attractive. Well, uh, it's very interesting to understand that people suppose I have the crystal ball, but uh, I'm trying to uh, give. A, you, an don't, you don't. You <laughs> don't. Um, well, in terms of uh, technologies, so you said fintech, fintech, as I said, it's very interesting. It's growing uh, in Europe very much. And uh, we are seeing some interesting phenomenon coming up, uh, like the so-called embedded finance, so financial services that are already embedded in other kind of services. Simple example is when you go to buy something on an online store and uh, uh, you find there uh, directly the service to uh, pay it, uh, in different rates, for example. Okay, so uh, and it's something that is having a lot of success. Uh, of course, those kind of services are also in B2B and not just B2C. Uh, but uh, finance, it's a uh, finance, uh, finance. Uh, uh, Fintech services are, uh, I mean, in the fields where uh, the money goes. So saving money, spending money, uh, investing money. Okay, those are the, the main, the main things. Um, 
what is happening also is uh, some of big uh, fintech European scale ups are starting to sell their technologies uh, under white label form uh, to old style banks because the, the traditional banks are starting to understand that in order to uh, keep and reach keep their customers and reach new ones, they need to uh, have uh, a technological platforms that allow them to offer those kind of services. And, and this is a very good, interesting open innovation case. Uh, instead of developing their own uh, platforms, they understood that it's much better to go to the uh, fintech scale apps that already have those kind of platforms and buy those uh, platform for, from them. And this is very, very good, a very interesting case that is happening right now. Um, other technologies, as I said before, space tech is very promising. I um, very agree with uh, um, Eric about quantum computing. Quantum computing is something that is going to explode very soon, also because quantum computing is a key technology uh, that allows us to do uh, things that now we cannot do because our actual computers are not powerful enough. So quantum computing is very important because it unlock uh, a, a, um, a computing potential that the, um, now we, we just we can just dream. And with that potential, we can develop new things, new technology in, in many fields. Uh, so it's very important. As long as uh, artificial intelligence, as long as uh, robotics, uh, those are the, 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 you know, the, the horizontal uh, technologies that we're going to uh, develop uh, and I... have an impact in different sectors. About the regions, uh, well, uh, it's, uh, uh, as I said uh, uh, in the past, the startup phenomenon is quite a worldwide phenomenon, okay? So you, you, you can find out startups in any part of the world. Of course, there are places where this is going to happen in faster and quicker and uh, places where it's going to happen in uh, uh, a slower pace. But uh, I think that, uh, I mean... Uh, it's, it's very interesting because Europe is very interesting in terms of the ability to match, to, to create a perfect, an equilibrium between makers and shapers. So uh, between the emerging technologies and the way to handle them uh, and their impact. Um, but, uh, you know, all indicators say that this is the Asian century. So I'll keep an eye on what's going <laughs> to happen to Asia. Over there, yeah. Uh, I would just have more, five more minutes. So I, I selected two questions, one for Tiziana and one for Eric. I would start with Eric because it's a little bit, uh, uh, let's say, mm, trying to put a little bit of discord in what, in what uh, Emil just said, which is saying effectively that quantum computing, we, we hear a lot about uh, people talking about quantum computing, but we all know that the true application are really uh, so far uh, just a few. Uh, where do you actually see concrete application? And I think this is more difficult time frame. When can we expect actually to see something for real happening? First, first of all, so the first question, where do we see potential? Uh, I think there are, let's say, uh, three big areas. The first one is uh, everything that has to do with optimization types of problems. And you could find them in more about all industries. Huh? Um, so how do I um, yeah, find an optimal solution given a set of poss possibilities? This is an abstract thing, but you could translate it also in, in finance types of problems and, and more. Huh? A second big area is uh, quantum chemistry. Uh, so uh, when we are going to simulate, um, let's say, quantum systems, quantum physics, um, and a third big area is, of course, everything that has to do with machine learning, artificial intelligence. Yeah? So that are the three big promising areas. Uh, we see already uh, quite some uh, algorithms that have been invented, that have even been tested out in an open source environment, KISKIT, yeah? uh, Quantum Information Science Kit. Of course, uh, at this moment in time, we see that the quantum computers 
the number of qubits um, is or not is not very high. Although huh, now we have uh, uh, machines of 127 qubits huh, um, that offers quite some possibilities already, and the roadmap is very promising. Huh? By 2023, uh, IBM has the plan to. Um, to launch machines of 1,121, 1,121 qubits, eh? 1,121 qubits. So meaning that this is not so far away. Eh? So I am very uh, believing strongly in the evolution of the hardware roadmap. Um, of course, the algorithms and software must follow. Eh? And there we see quite some research going on. So, I will not be able to answer your question in that year, uh, Thomas. So there will be a quantum advantage. I don't dare to say that, but it is not, in my opinion, it is certainly coming. It is not, um, it, 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 it will come huh, at a given moment in time because there is so much research going on on the hardware, software level. Um, we also often say um, it is, um, yeah, it is. Uh, there are no fast followers in quantum computing. Uh, you you need to already develop some knowledge and skills to pick it up when it the moment is there. Um, yeah. So interesting. Much, yeah. Interesting. Just uh, because we're running out of time, uh, just the last question uh, for uh, for Tiziana. Um, we we talked about a lot of things. We talked with new job, how to hire new people, quantum computing, blockchain, artificial intelligence, and how it's all changing the industry. Uh, what's the future of uh, uh, job demand, basically? Where do you think there will be more job opportunities opening up? And uh, where uh, do we need to be aware that, uh, you know, some people will need to relocate? On mute, you're on mute. It is a really challenge how the jobs transforms themselves as the organization transforms uh, themselves. We know that uh, the open innovation uh, is a way to, uh, to enhance the collaboration among the different uh, skills and among different jobs, uh, different roles and different competencies. So as, uh, as also we can see in the organization, there is the need to, um, to move toward more interdisciplinary groups and open and also to have uh, uh, an upskilling of, uh, of human resources that are able to fast move from one task to another. And also they have the ability to collaborate with a different people that have a different frame of mind. So the future of jobs, uh, we can see that uh, as the organization has for more interdis interdisciplinary uh, profile, which also experiences comes from the different context. The ability to be flexible and also the ability to be move uh, faster in the new uh, in the new context. That is all the possibility to move from one film to another film. If we can see also as the film transform themselves, for example, through the merger and acquisition, or how an incubator can be moved in the organization of new firms. So one of the main challenges for the new, the new jobs is to move toward the more interdisciplinary competencies and also to, uh, to be more flexible in the way to, to connect more different and distant, both research, but also management skills inside organizations. Fantastic. Uh, I think we run out of time. Uh, I thank you all for, for joining us today. And uh, we're going to reply to the question that we have open still on uh, via email. So thank you, everyone. And we all wish you a very uh, uh, happy Christmas uh, uh, with your families, if you do it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.